Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Father, I pray that you would make that happen in our generation. That all the remaining unreached, unengaged peoples will be penetrated by this generation. That you would go before the army that you are raising up, the army of love, the army of peace makers, the army of reconcilers, that you would go before them and disillusion the nations with their gods. Any God but Jesus, may he come to nothing in the minds and the hearts of many so that there are Corneliuses and Lydias and Ethiopian eunuchs all over the world when the army of peacemaking arrives. Grant, Lord of the harvest, that in this room you would raise up many to be radical senders and radical goers. Lord, magnify your Son, Jesus Christ. Send the Holy Spirit in sync with the gospel all over the world and glorify Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who was crucified, that he might redeem for himself a people from all the peoples and tongues and tribes of the earth. So move in our day, Lord. Take down every barrier. Open doors nobody expected to be open. And bring the nations to yourself, we ask through Christ. Amen. We're making our way through 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 with a view to its missionary implications. Missions is not the same thing as local evangelism. Missions, frontier missions, if you want to put that word on the front of it, is the specialized calling to the church to plant the church, make disciples in peoples where the church hasn't yet taken root. The International Board of Missions estimates 3,100 unengaged people groups. That is, nobody has yet developed an evangelical plan for even targeting them. And I want to leave you with the impression that's a very small number. There are 305 million evangelicals in the world. That's 98,000 evangelicals for each of the unreached, unengaged people groups. There are 4.6 million Christian congregations in the world. That's 1,483 congregations for every unengaged people group. There are 44,000 Christian denominations in the world. That's 14 whole denominations for every unengaged people group. There are 4,900 mission sending agencies in the world. And you can do the math on that one. Two whole mission agencies. If 10% of the Passion Conference last January and Urbana last December and the Crew Conferences over Christmas, if if 10% of those students felt called newly to the unreached peoples of the world, then we would have 
How many? Three missionaries. For every one of those unengaged groups. And the reason I, I just mentioned that statistic is because that gathering of those students is an infinitesimal part of the Christian students in India and China and South Korea. And I mentioned those three countries because after the United States, those are the three largest sending countries. They send out more missionaries than any other country in the world. The point is, 3,100 unengaged peoples is small. We can do this if we will, which is a big if. The world, the flesh, the devil, war against the will of the church to do this. It's not a mistake or an accident that we are doing exposition at a missions conference because if this will is to be sustained, the will to reach 3,100 unengaged peoples, it will be the will of faith. It will be sustained by faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing <coughs> by the word of Christ, and hence exposition. So my job is to take verses 1 to 10 of chapter 5, and as I see it, strengthen your faith and your will, and perhaps clarify your calling to be a part of this great task. The whole of this unit, chapter 4 and 5, begins with Paul's statement that his ministry is given to him by mercy. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, and it ends with a great missionary call to be ambassadors and summon the world to make peace with God. That verse in chapter one of, uh, chapter four, verse one, was a huge verse for me when I was 28. I was married, had a child, no job, finishing graduate school, wanted to serve Jesus, and no place to do it. And one of my most influential teachers wrote me and quoted this verse to me, and he said, John, you will have your ministry as clearly by mercy as you were saved by mercy. Because that's what the verse literally says. We have, this, we have this ministry as we were shown mercy. In the same way we were shown mercy to be saved on the Damascus Road, we have this ministry. My conversion and my ministry come together, Paul said. You will have your ministry as surely by mercy as you were saved by mercy. And that was true. That came true. Ministry is by mercy. We have it by mercy. And then you've heard Don and David unpack chapter 4. Jars of clay, this gospel moves forward in weakness and we're of good courage and do not lose heart in verse 16. And verses 1 to 10 of chapter 5 are intended by Paul to give added reasons for why you shouldn't lose heart in the ministry of the Word, and in particular in our case, the cause of world missions. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you four more reasons 
why you should have a joyfully serious courage in the cause of world missions. So I think that's the thesis over this message. You should have, as a, a follower of Jesus, a joyfully serious courage in the cause of world missions. And this text that I'm to unpack is four reasons for that. And I didn't have to do any homiletical gymnastics to find four R's. So I'll tell you what they are. Realism, this is my outline, you can write it down, I'm going to follow it. Realism, resurrection, reunion, and reward. Number one, realism. These are four foundations for joyfully serious courage, for not losing courage. He's still arguing for verse 16 of chapter 4. Few things are more disillusioning in life and in missions than shattered expectations based on real unrealistic expectations, right? And therefore, one of the best remedies that Paul could give us for not being disillusioned in ministry is to give us really realistic expectations, which is what these chapters are doing. Clay pot expectations, you could call them. So that's what verses 1 to 5 are about. Let's read them. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. He pops four bubbles of unrealistic expectations. So under realism, there are four evidences of realism that will keep us from having disillusionment. Number one, we live in a tent, not a building. He calls this body a tent, not a castle, not a fortress, not a building, but a tent. Verse one, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, verse 2, for in this tent, verse 4, for while we are in this tent, and the point of calling it a tent is that tents aren't very good against harsh weather. Nobody expects a tent to last very long against harsh, hot, cold, windy, rainy, snowy weather. Therefore, since that's where you live all your life long, you should be free from the expectation that you can escape frailty and transience. Jars of clay equals live in tents. Verse 18 of chapter 4, the things that are seen like tents are transient. We do missions in our bodies. Would there were another way? There is no other way. We do missions and ministry in our bodies. They are frail and they are temporary. That's the first piece of realism. Number two. 
this tent may be destroyed. Verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, not just tattered, not just shabby, not just threadbare, not just wasting away, but destroyed. Adnar and Judson was the first missionary to leave the shores of America, and he buried three wives. And the children of Anne, his first wife, he buried all of them. The first one born dead. The second one lived 17 months and died. The third little girl outlived her mother by six months and died. This is the way it's been since Adam. And this is the way mission will go forward because the tent is destroyed. Get rid of every expectation to live a long life or to be married to somebody who lives a long life or to have babies who live a long time. Get rid of it. He didn't come home for years and years. Buried them all there. Number three. He pops the bubble of unrealistic expectations in describing not only the objective destruction of the tent, but the subjective groaning of the tent. Verse 2, in this tent we groan. Verse 4, while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not once in a while, but while you live in the tent, you groan. That's all the time. Being a Christian doesn't lessen the groaning of being human. Being a missionary doesn't lessen the groaning of being a Christian. I would argue being a Christian intensifies the groaning of being human and being a missionary intensifies the groaning of being a Christian. So be free of all illusions of not groaning. You're going to groan. While you live in the tent, you're going to groan. The tent has nerve endings. It has physical and emotional limits. It can break. I know one great veteran missionary whose spouse has valiantly battled seasonally immobilizing depression their entire lives. And they never quit. Number four, fourth point under realism. He pops the bubble of the unrealistic expectations by calling the Holy Spirit a down payment. Verse 5, second half of the verse, He has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Now, guarantee is right as a translation, but it, it's only half right. It's not, I think, a very effective translation because it only gets half the meaning of arabon. Arabon means payment of part of a purchase price in advance, BDAG. The point is, it really is a down payment of what's coming, and the other half of the point is, it's only a down payment. And guarantee misses that. Someday, you will have the rest of the down payment. Someday, not now. That's half the point. 
That's realism. He's a down payment, not a full price. Get used to it. The Holy Spirit dwells in you and doesn't make you well all the time. Doesn't cause you to escape from all kinds of suffering. He is a precious, 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 only down payment. 